Welcome to the Inspire Health Podcast. Your life is about to get a whole lot better. Have you ever felt like you tried everything and yet still couldn't find the answers or the solutions that you were seeking? Whether you're dealing with chronic illness, physical or emotional pain, I want you to know that your body is the most sophisticated machine on planet Earth. Your body holds unfathomable wisdom. Trust in it and learn from it. Know that there are answers and there are solutions to your specific health challenges. And we will be uncovering all of them here on the Inspire Health Podcast. I'm so excited to be a part of your healing journey. Your transformation starts now. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for tuning into the Inspire Health Podcast. And welcome back to our 10-part series on yoga, finding calm amidst the storm. Today's guest is Yoga Rupa Rod Stryker. Rod is a world-renowned yoga and meditation teacher, guiding and sharing his wisdom for over 40 years. He's the founder of Para Yoga and the author of The Four Desires, Creating a Life of Purpose, Happiness, Prosperity, and Freedom. He is the co-creator of one of the most comprehensive online yoga trainings in the world, and most recently, the app Sanctuary, a premier destination for all levels of those wanting to experience the life-changing practices of meditation and yoga nidra, also known as enlightened sleep. Rod has dedicated his life to improving lives through his lectures, writing, practice, teaching, leadership, service, and family life. Rod, what a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks for being a part of our series. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. You actually, when I look at this list of uh, people you're speaking to, there are a lot of very old uh, friends, friends that I've known for a long time, so, and some real authorities in, in, you know, on the subject of well-being, so I'm honored to be part of it. Oh, my pleasure. I was really happy to have it rounded out as I think everybody's had such different diverse experiences in these in these worlds of yoga. And it's really fun for me to be able to just pick different pieces and see how different people even perspectives can be similar and sometimes different, but it all just adds more richness to this, this world of yoga that we're all trying to learn more about. Ideally, you know, that is the sense of it. I mean, it is a tapestry. And there are you know, traditions within yoga and then sub, sub traditions within yoga. And, uh, and, and often there are some really interesting distinctions that are made. And I think by making some of the distinctions, getting different voices as, as you know, as, as you are, it winds up allowing people to really find what is the stream, uh, what is the stream that they most resonate with that mm -hmm. speaks to them the most directly. And, uh, you know, that's a beautiful idea. It's, you know, that, that there are these different options and different kind of transmissions that relate to these uh, core ideas around yoga, well-being, truth, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of it like when you read books, and a lot of times you can get the same message from lots of different books, but it just depends on how it's worded and how it resonates with you and whether or not you can understand and, and receive that message in, in the right way at the right time. And I find the same thing with different teachers. It's, you just pick up different pieces of, from different people. You know, and the other part of it too is two people or three people can read the same book and there's a distinct part of each of those books speaks to their heart and that's what we extract. That's what we're inspired by. That's what we needed to hear. So mm -hmm. all of that is true. So yeah, yeah. yeah. very true. Rod, can you give us a little bit of a background as far as, as you've been in this world for a long time, and how did you end up getting into the world of yoga where it became such a foundational part of your life? The how of it is, uh, you know, it just was so effective, you know, in, in the end. I, I went to college, I went to university to st and, and uh, the my, my interest was in philosophy and psychology. And, um, you know, at, by the time I was a junior studying as a philosophy major, I, I kind of was as less excited about psychology the more I studied it. And so I turned almost completely to philosophy at that point. And then I was, how was, I was all of 19, almost 20, my junior year of college. And I discovered yoga and frankly, you know, just to put it in the simplest terms, I found an experience of what I was looking through for through the study of philosophy. I found a direct experience of it in yoga. And the, the, the immediacy of the experience and what was what I began to feel within myself growing and even call it wasn't even growing yet. It was just hatching. 
And uh, the sense was that this is what I had been looking for. I never really wanted to be a philosophy professor. It would also be a long, long, long time, I would say a good 10 to 15 years once I started yoga that I even, the idea of teaching yoga became something that I would conceive of, that I would accept. Um, but the idea that was that this was the path that I had always been, I'd been looking for something uh, from a fairly young age and yoga seemed to deliver it very directly to me. And I would tell you then the other critical point was really finding a teacher. About three years later, I had the great fortune to, to study with a master who had been teaching for 40 years, was a pretty, pretty mature man, very full, very rounded, developed individual who, you know, there was just something in him that uh, inspired and motivated me to get deeper into yoga. And I would say really having a teacher who understood the depth and the range of what yoga could be and what it was and could provide methodologies and, and, and a basis for studying it, yoga in a deep way. That was really how yoga became such a fixture in my life and, and the defining really as much as anything that defined me, you know, that would be, that would go on to define me, I should say. Mm -hmm. I've seen that a lot with people too, where they've often, if they've been in some of the Western psychology and then they've dipped their toes into yoga. I know my wife's experience was very much like that. She was doing psychology in school. And then when she came into the world of yoga, it was, it, provided her more of a direct experience that I think she was intellectually trying to understand from Western psychology, but it was this visceral knowingness of just having the raw experience of what I think she was trying to make sense of in her head. And then she was able to kind of blend the two together to some point, I think, because especially in the West, I think we like to intellectualize and understand things in a certain way, but it's the experience of yoga that I think really captured her heart around it too you know there's another piece i think and uh around that as well and that is that the uh, what dominates the psychological uh, you know the field of psychology in the west i don't say it's it's only the only piece but it's certainly what's been the dominant part of the theme of psychology for a long time has been pathology in essence it's you know learning to work with the parts of us that are less than ideally, let's say less than optimally functioning. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we put on the table with our therapist. We don't go to the therapist when we're feeling absolutely perfect. We we're, we're processing this pathology. And then, you know, within psychology, of course, there's many different ways of doing it, different approaches. But what yoga, yoga, uh, uh, what's so fascinating, I think, and so meaningful is that you've got those two parts. You've got yoga is definitely going to help us gain insight about the parts of us that are necessarily functioning at the highest levels. Uh, certainly the Yoga Sutra does that. So the basis of yoga is this self-study and self-inquiry piece. But there's also the opposite of pathology, which is it, it, it brings us to the edge of coherence. And coherence in that sense means that which is undivided or unfragmented. So the, the, that soul or spirit now becomes this other resource. So in a way, yoga provides us not all of what psychology today would provide us with, but certainly a way of understanding our shadow, our less constructive parts, and combined with this profound connection to unity with spirit. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also part of the attraction as well. Yeah, I, I think it's neat too, because what we're seeing in some of the worlds, one of the series, I was just talking to Stephen Cope about this too, but one of the series that we're doing down the road is on trauma. And what's really fascinating with trauma right at the moment is that a lot of the, even the Western psychology ways of working with trauma are now borrowing a lot from Eastern traditions. So they're incorporating a lot of stuff around yoga, very, very powerful, useful technique to work with trauma, mindfulness, meditation, and then even areas of like body-centered psychology body-centered psychotherapy but it's really fascinating because a lot of the stuff that's been done for thousands of years in certain traditions are now becoming a mainstay treatment even in in our western world 
Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, for those of us who've been steeped in, in yoga and perhaps, um, you know, uh, looking at the, um, not just, obviously not just the physical parts of it, but if you're starting to talk about trauma and um, like the shadow aspects of our psychology, it's not surprising that eventually psychology would have to expand out of this more pathological model you know, exclusively pathological model. And, uh, and, and if we are really to heal, it really means that we have to embrace sooner or later the idea and then ultimately the, the experience that a part of us is, we're not entirely dysfunctional, that a part of us remains above it or, or beyond it, and that a part of us has not fundamentally changed in any way and, but, and it hasn't been altered by any experiences good, bad, right, wrong, um, you know, rich, poor, male, female. And when we start including, you know, by virtue of including that part of us that is whole into the equation of understanding the part of us that isn't, it gives us, it's become so complementary and ultimately gives us a way of objectifying our dysfunction. And, you know, it also gives us something to turn to when we, spend a lot of time thinking about or um, locked into uh, uh, the less than constructive parts of ourselves. We, we, we can be reminded that when we deeply relax and we steady the mind, that, that we are in fact whole. Well, it's, I think about this in the world of health a little bit too, where a lot of times in conventional medicine, we look for more pathology. It's very much more pathology driven, what's wrong, and then how do we fix what's wrong? And from more of an integrative approach, we usually more look at what's the human potential capable of and how do we move more towards that as opposed to trying to fix what's wrong? How do we just move more towards what's possible, right? And sometimes I feel like yoga kind of opens up the, or the, in the, I think some of the deeper texts around that, the there's the concept of there, you sort of have this idea of what's possible, what's available to you rather than almost more focusing on where's the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not only, it doesn't make sense. It's an accurate depiction of what the tradition is actually pointing us to. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a really a vital part of the yoga sutra, which is the seminal text on yoga. And uh, in the second chapter, uh, this, uh, in the second chapter of this four-chapter uh, scripture, he, he talks about the whole purpose, uh, the purpose, in short, the way, the purpose of the challenges that we face in life, you know, it, and it's something that comes up for students sooner or later. A lot of students who turn toward yoga, inevitably, there's this question of, okay, if our essence, if we are essentially whole, then why do we encounter a world which consistently makes us feel insecure or fearful or we experience pain and suffering? And um, the, the teaching ultimately is, and it's quite, I don't want to say controversial, but it's, a, it's one that we need to look into because it's basically he says that the purpose of this, of the world and the purpose of suffering is to ultimately realize freedom and fulfillment. And that's a kind of confusing idea to people. Okay. I'm inherently full and whole. I have challenges. And then at the same time, the purpose of those challenges is to actually experience wholeness and uh, freedom specifically and fulfillment. And so what, you know, the missing link there is how, how does it do that? And the answer is by more fully understanding who you are, you know, the less obvious part, kind of beyond the rational mind, by learning to uh, touch that part of you is, that is the deepest, you then become more capable of finding greater freedom and fulfillment. So our pain sends us on a journey of self-discovery. And the further we go on that path to self-discovery, the more of freedom and fulfillment we can experience. So it's not just making sense what you said. It's really defining the path hmm. that we look beyond pathology. We look beyond our pain and, and, and so that we can really discover mm -hmm. uh, 
the part of us that has been whole all along. I, I think that that's a really profound and accurate statement for us to think about at any times a big challenge or transition. And I can't help but think of just what the global situation is right at the moment and what's going on. How, how would you sort of take that perspective for people currently? Because I mean, right now there's, there's so much uncertainty and there's concerns and there's fears around all sorts of different stuff going on. But at the same point, yeah. I feel like as a global community, we've probably been more connected than we've ever been. So how would you take that concept and apply it to what's going on currently as best as you'd be able to that might, might provide people with some perspective? Yeah, I mean, perspective, I think in this case, you know, in this instance is as important as anything we can do is finding, finding a, a holistic perspective. And first, what I would say is to understand that the, that, that, um, that the fundamental cause of fear is not new. Um, we all experience fear all the time, whether we're conscious it or, of it or not. The circumstances that create our fear are different all the time. They're ever changing. Obviously, um, COVID-19 is, is an extreme circumstance creating you know, justifiable concern, let me just say that. But if we understand that fear is, a, is, a, is an existential phenomenon, it's not a circumstantial phenomenon. So we're human beings, and uh, that means we're moral. And so whether we're aware of it or not, you know, the shadow of death <laughs> is always present in our life. We're all mortal, so the shadow of death is present. Now, again, you go to the Yoga Sutras and they say, well, the fear of loss, which is what I think if we wanted to kind of find one way of describing the fear of the certainty, it's like we're going to lose the things that, are, that we have, that we value, job, money, home, income, family members, you know, potentially to the disease itself. We, fear of loss is rooted in this fear of death. So I, I, it sounds a little grim, but I'm going to come out the other side and we'll have, we'll have a sense of, uh, of, of salvation or a sense of direction. But that fear is, as I said, follows us throughout our life. And it, and it has to. And it, in fact, a lot of our mental energy is solely devoted to keeping us safe. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes to the extreme. Sometimes we dis disperse more energy than we need to about whether or not present circumstances are safe or not. But, that, but we need a mind that has some orientation to what is safe and what is not safe. Now, what that effectively means then, if we look at it from the context of yoga, it says that the fear, from the fear of death, all fear of loss comes. So again, that's what we're all facing. Even if it's not my mortality I, I'm, I'm worried about today, and confronted with today, I'm facing the fear that I'll lose the things that are precious to me or that they are now in danger. Number one, I, I would ask people to really realize that fear was present prior to the, this, the, the pandemic. We were maybe not have been as conscious of it. So then what I would say, and this is where yoga really has a lot to offer us, and, and, and particularly meditation and contemplation, and that is that we begin to uh, um, consider, is, is there a possibility, we begin to consider the source and then how to resolve that source. And this is why really there are a couple of basic things. Number one is in the ultimate sense, it's to have a glance or an experience or a taste of a part of you that's not at the mercy of mortality. And, and this is clearly what these more, what contemplative traditions and meditation-based traditions have always sought out. In fact, the Tibetan tradition, if you will, Tibetan Buddhist tradition is explicit that spiritual practice is not so much to have a better life, is it's to have a better death. 
And what they are essentially meaning by that is that by connecting to the part of you that's permanent, beyond even this body, we begin to live this life with less fear. Because we're basically having this interface with a part of us that isn't impermanent. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually will practice so that it, it's explicit in, in those traditions that you practice in order to have less fear while you're alive and then ultimately less fear when you pass. And so in the ultimate sense, there's that. The, there's this concept. And this is why, you know, meditation, 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 it almost doesn't matter what tradition, what dissemination of it you're practicing. What's more important is that you are looking beyond your, you know, your temporary circumstances to rest in the ultimate sense of security. And that is that which is permanent, as opposed to everything that we can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell, which is effectively impermanent. And if impermanence is our only frame of reference for who we are, we're living on very fragile ground. You know, at any minute, it all changes. Now, you know, there's some interesting terms. Uh, there's this idea of mirror neurons and you're probably familiar with mirror neurons, which is the effect of collective consciousness. The effect of, if I'm with a lot of people who are at ease, I will, my body will actually start to resonate with that and I will start to feel more at ease. Now, a trip to the market, um, which I only do about once a week, is the opposite. It's, it's an adventure in mirror neuron experiences because I'm here right now. I'm writing a book and uh, seeing hardly anyone. Little visit, you know, my kids are here. And besides that, it's, we're, it's quiet. But I go to the market and within about a few aisles, I start noticing my breathing changing, my heart rate changing because by virtue of having to keep my six feet distance, mm -hmm. moving the, you know, being all very polite and everything, but still wearing our masks in the market, my mirror, mirror neurons are firing about fear, firing with fear. So I really think at this time, uh, we really have to tend to our nervous system because these are reptilian, the most basic kind of responses there are. You can credit your limbic system, your autonomic nervous system for taking over and literally just grabbing your emotions and grabbing your responses or reactions and going into the baseline of survival instinct. Um, so um, I would say on the one hand, you know, there's this more grand spiritual concept of ultimately having a, a spiritual basis to, by which you see yourself. But the other thing is we really have to tend to our nervous systems and, and, and I would just, you know, remind or inform those, of those, you know, in the audience who are listening is um, the fastest way to change your nervous system is not a yoga pose. It's your breathing. That's a direct line to your nervous system. And uh, that's why I'm really counseling people in these days to pause uh, ideally three times a day for three to five minutes and simply shape your breath as smoothly and evenly as you can. And within a short period of time, you'll notice a transition back to a less reactive, less kind of primitive response to the stimuli that is going on in the world right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point too, to talk about the mirror neurons, because sometimes people don't realize how much we are affected by one another just by, and we're designed for that it's so that we can pick up on each other it was really fascinating i was just listening to a discussion a little while ago kind of tying into that around mirror neurons and it was with a quantum physicist named dr amit goswami and mm. he he talks about um sort of these different levels of health and whatnot and he was talking about mirror neurons and that for the most part that's going to work back and forth but where you can start to get beyond the mirror neurons is when you get into the place of empathy so not sympathy and not and and when you get into that place of empathy that's actually not working with the mirror neurons so it's almost a place and it makes me think when you are doing 
deeper practice where you are doing work with breathing and with meditation, that that's, that part naturally starts to arise as you do more work with that. And in some ways, I think that's what that almost internal resilience of empathy where you're connected, but you're at the same point, not taking it all on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a critical distinction. And it does require um, awareness, if you will. It does require cognition. Um, in essence, um, uh, to, to create a conscious shift from the transitory nature of emotion and thought. And, you know, there is some, uh, there is some really new and, and profound thinking around what emotion is. And, and uh, it's, it's, it, it, it really isn't quite what even as recently as a decade ago we thought emotion was, where somatically there was this orientation to the emotions are more representative of one's authenticity or one's truth. And now what they're finding, the simplest way I describe it is that emotions are really sensations of which there are not a lot of different kinds of sensations. So there's tight and loose and ex, uh, accelerated and you know decelerated and accelerated. There's not a lot of, of actual distinct emotions, but there are emotions that then take us back into stories. Specifically, the, then the beliefs that came out of our early experiences in our life. So emotions are not ultimately um, a deep truths, what they do is they're triggered out of these reassociations to reassociating to something that happened to us previously. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of what you're offering in regard to um, this distinction of empathy, it's really like having to be aware of stepping outside of the transitory nature of even sensation and the stories that get triggered. And that, that, that is, as I said earlier, it's both tending to our neurology, tending to our autonomic nervous system, that I think is the critical piece of that. Because it's all well and good for me to say, hey, you know, there's the potential to be completely, to absolve yourself of all the worry and angst and all those kinds of things as you're walking down, as you're putting your mask on to go marketing these days. That's not so easily done, you know. Best to my devices, my sensations are pumping. I soon will start, my cortisol levels will start shifting. All sorts of things will happen. And now my thoughts are starting to go. Um, we need some, what I would offer is there's the need for an intervention. And uh, uh, the easiest way to create that interruption to the cycle, or most immediate way, I should say, is change the way you breathe. And then change your intention, you know. Uh, the disquiet, if you go what I said earlier, it wasn't meant to be purely theoretical, is our discomfort in life is a signal to investigate ourselves more deeply, to look inward, as it were. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. It ties me to another question I want to ask you in a sec, but in, um, yes, yes. As, as you were talking about um, the stories that get connected with it, I think of it very much the mm -hmm. same way too how we look at it is that the, the, the feeling is just the sensation. So there's no, nothing really attached to it other than just sensation, like you said, tight or loose or you know, buzzing or not buzzing, whatever it might be. But then when the brain kicks in and it establishes a meaning to what we think that feeling now represents, as soon as the brain decides a meaning associated with that, so to that sensation, now we create an emotion. And it's that now that's what's got the triggers tied around to it, it seems. And so mm -hmm. like you're saying, that's when you right. do a break where you get people to start to focus on breath for a little bit, I mean, a couple of things happen outside of just the physiological effects that you're calming down your vagus nerve, you're getting the nervous system to start to settle down a little bit. You're also putting a bit of a break in that patterning that we've attached meaning to sensation. Right, And so just in putting a block in that, we start the process of breaking up those neural networks that have created a, a pattern or a habit. 
So it makes me think, as I think I've, I've heard you speak about something along this before, but the interconnection between samskara and then habits, experience, desire, how that all kind of interweaves. Yeah, I think you're, you might be referring to this. Um, it's actually called the karma chakra, and, and it's, a, it's a principle in the yoga tradition uh, so you, I mean, well, I think most people understand the word karma, but it, you know, the idea is that as, as it's happened in the past, it's, it's going to have an influence and a shape into the future. Chakra in this context means wheel. So it's this, we're kind of on this loop in essence. Mm -hmm. um, it's also sometimes called simply samsara, which means repetitive action. And what you and I have been speaking about for the last few minutes is this idea that we don't necessarily have to be the victim of what we've done in the past. And as you made the point, there needs to be some type of interruption in, in the cycle. A, one, of, one of the things I said in my book, The Four Desires, I wrote that, you know, if we don't consciously choose a different present, the past will choose it for us. In other words, if we don't consciously make, somehow interrupt the cycles and the influence of the past, we're just going to be doing more, uh, another version. We're going to just be doing the past again, but the circumstances might be a little different. We might be a little older, a little more aged. So um, that's the main thing. I mean, the, this, this is, again, a, an area where psychology and the yoga tradition are, wow, they share a lot of, of maybe slightly different language, but a similar view of things, which is that the past it's called samskara in the yoga tradition. That means more specifically the impressions from the past. And every experience creates an impression. And some are profound, and, you know, obviously, and some are pretty uh, not so significant. But it always, the past then creates what's called a vasana. And a vasana is a tendency. Um, I'll give you an example. I... Until about a year ago, I had not had five cups of coffee in my whole life. And I was in Bali, and uh, I don't know what possessed me, but I had a, <laughs> had a, a wonderful coffee. And I've always liked the taste, but my body type and metabolism is such that uh, stimulants are not very good for me in general. I, did, I felt fine. I was a little worried that I'd be hyper or whatever. But the bottom line, why I'm mentioning this is because in the last three months, I've had more coffee than several lifetimes. I mean, I've had coffee probably 50 times. And um, I, don't use, I don't use it. It's funny. It sounds like a drug. I don't use it when I'm teaching because I don't like the one time, the one occasion I had, it didn't feel right at all. Um, it kind of feels like it, it uh, hinders a certain level of sensitivity and kind of a little bit more of authentic rhythm that I'm obviously I have 40 years of teaching in. But sitting at my desk writing a book, it's very helpful. I've noticed it just helps. It helps me focus. And uh, not so much focus, but follow through on, yeah. uh, on clinging different ideas. Anyway, that one cup of uh, cappuccino in Bali created a tendency that's called a vasana. And now, I would say within two hours of waking up, if I know I'm writing, all the thoughts and sensations and smells of what coffee is like start wafting back at me. So that's an example. And by the way, this pattern is not, we can judge, you know, you can pass judgment about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. The point is that this samskara vasana thing isn't necessarily bad or good. It's just a phenomenon that occurs. Another would be, for example, where we started this conversation. You asked me what made yoga stick, you know, what made yoga such a part of your life. I had good experiences with it in the very beginning. And it created a vasana where I did more. And those created the vasanas where I would do more. So that's the phenomenon. But when we're dealing with something that's non-constructive, let's say worry is a vasana. Now, that might sound strange, counterintuitive to some people who are listening, but the tradition says that before we think a thought, there's a decision to think that thought. Before we take any action, there's a decision to take that action. I mean, it's, you know, I'm raising right now my glass to have some more water. 
there was a decision to do that. Now that makes more sense to most of us than that I'm actually giving myself permission to have a thought prior to thinking it. But if we trace it down in its most kind of seed-like form, we'll find this is what was revealed by these great sages of, um, who saw the mind in its most subtle aspects. And there's actually a decision to think the thoughts you think. Now, where does that decision come from? If the thoughts are not constructive and we even feel less than, um, how would I say, less than glorified by thinking, exalted, if you will, by thinking the thoughts we think, where does that come from? Well, it comes from our vasana, comes from the tendency, the, the tendency that was born from the fact we've done it in the past. So I think you asked the question in the context of uh, there's opportunities to intervene. One of the things I, I offer, and I'm not sure if this was um, maybe the source of your question, is you know, I, call, I call this opportunity something called a, a departure point. In other words, if we're not just going to maintain the, 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 the current of uh, the past, and what I mean by current, I mean literally like the stream of a river mm -hmm. that has a particular flow in it, I have to somehow interrupt that current in order to amplify my ability to choose to get out of it. You know, it's almost like if the current's moving too fast, you're in a river, you need a eddy, you need something that's gonna take you out of the speed of your current, the, the intensity of repetitive action that gives you the best opportunity to get out of the water. Don't try and get out when it's moving too fast. So what do you do? I actually find that the best thing we can do is to recognize that you're in the midst of a habit, that this is actually born from habit, habituation, and stop the physical action as it relates to the habit. It's harder to stop a thought than it is to stop a physical action. And usually you'll almost always see that there's an unconscious action happening combined, that's combining or the expression of the thought that you, that's not helping. Stop the physical action of the thought, of the, uh, stop the physical action. And then use that opportunity to rechart, to literally redirect your attention. Um, and it gives us leverage. It's not always easy, but it gives us a certain leverage to choose some, a different course. And in, in these times, uh, nothing could be more valuable in a sense, you know, nothing could be more valuable than us slowing down, finding that uh, opportunity in the flow of if it's fear or, or pain or um, discomfort that we're experiencing, find the habit that's being acted upon and where you feel like you're in the midst of it, stop for a moment redirect your emotions, your, uh, your thoughts, redirect your attention. And, and, and I would offer one more thing. It's like um, reclaim your rightful role as it relates to your own mind. And my first teacher some almost 40 years ago said something, it's still with me. He said, the mind makes a terrible master and a wonderful slave. And it suggests that we are something other than our mind. There's an opportunity to step outside the mind and, and, um, and, and use it rather than being used by it. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard that phrase before too, and I really like that phrase. And um, I think that makes a lot of sense the way you broke that down. And it's almost like just bringing more awareness to what you're doing and more consciousness into it that's what starts to give you the little break, just being purely aware of what it is that's going on. And then you've got that little space where you can then maybe do something different to redirect it, which that's then right. starts to unravel that pattern. It doesn't become so sticky anymore, it seems. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, again, I, I really recognize it's not easy. Um, it's not easy. Um, but in a sense, you want to give yourself every opportunity. We all deserve that opportunity uh, to 
recollect ourselves, as it were, and not just get swept up in the current. Um, if we, you know, I mean, in a sense, my theme, it seems like the one theme I'm, I'm keep coming back to here is understand that your discomfort is an opportunity to self-reflect about where you've lost yourself. Even in this day and age, we could blame our discomfort on the virus. We could blame our, the threat of our, our income on, uh, a, 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 as, as the source. A, 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 we could blame it on this, on this threat to our income or whatnot. But understand really that it's all just an opportunity to understand yourself better. And ultimately that turning toward understanding is what's gonna make it more possible for us to experience more fulfillment and more freedom ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Go ahead, Rod, when you were talking about um, along the same line as that, when we go through discomfort and that that's, that's, part, of the, that's part of the process, it's part yeah. of the Dharma with it, but the real value in it is when it points to us to be, to gain some more self-discovery. So yeah. what is sort of the process to really try and gain more of that self-discovery? What, what's sort of required for people if they're not used to really slowing down to even be introspective about things? How do you start the process of self-discovery for someone that might not be used to doing that? What, where do you even begin with that? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because it, it, in a sense, it's, um, there's almost no hope. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, let me tell you a quick, a really quick story about this. Cause I do have a, I do have a simple answer for you. And, but, but I think an illustration will helpful, be helpful. Some years ago, I hadn't seen a student of mine for a good, um, almost 10 years. In the intervening time, so this was about four or five years ago, it was the first time I'd seen her in about 10 years. Prior to that, she was a deeply committed yoga student and meditator and uh, really, a, you know, and, and really a, 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 lovely, a lovely practitioner, a lovely student. Then um, something significant happened in her family's life. Her husband sold his company uh, and they netted somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to $70 million. You know, mind-boggling sum of money. Again, this is now about 15 years ago. So it's, I mean, it's a lot of money now, but it was even yeah. more money then, which it seems hard to believe. Long story short, they bought a house, moved from Los Angeles, bought a house in Santa Barbara and a house in France, which they then moved to, you know, half the year in each. And... They had this very wonderful life. They lived uh, in Paris and in Santa Barbara. Then they sold the house in the apartment in Paris. They moved to Spain for several years, et cetera. And I, through uh, the, the person who introduced us, um, I heard about her life and I heard about their wonderful things and, and all this kind of stuff. But she had told me, the mutual friend had told me more than once that, you know, Suzanne's, this person has lost her way in terms of her practice. Anyway, when she came to see me five years just four or five years ago, she said, um, you know, I just don't, can't seem to practice. You know, there's so much going on in my life and, and it's et cetera, et cetera. And I looked at her and I said, you know, if you're asking me how you will now recommit yourself to the practice that brought you so much reward, I said, I don't see much hope for that. And she looked at me completely startled as if like that was the last thing in the world she expected her yogi to say to her, there's not much hope that you'll ever practice again. And she said, well, why would you say something like that? I said, simply, I think you're too comfortable. I think your life is such that you can almost afford to distract yourself from your pain. And you can do it to such an extent that remedying the pain in a, in a meaningful way, in a way that's really going to change it is just, you know, who wouldn't want to go buy, you know, go shopping down the Champs-Élysées than instead of sitting and meditating or changing your breathing, I'd rather go shopping on the Champs-Élysées anytime I had some discomfort. And that was what this woman, that's the new place she was in in her life or had been. So I would offer that the first and greatest blessing is pain. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, human beings don't, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but 
My understanding of all the research is we don't do things. 95% of human behavior is shaped by pain avoidance, not pursuing pleasure, but actually pain avoidance. So, you know, that's psychology 101. So it's basically suggesting that in the end, I'll seek yoga or meditation or do my breathing or do those things when I recognize that I'm in pain. And if I try and pretend that I'm not, chances are I won't practice. Or if I find that changing my breathing is more painful than having, than occupying myself with the certain distractions, mm -hmm. then I'll do, then I'll avoid the breathing. So I, I, when I said there's no hope, I would say, look, the, the first gift is that there is discomfort, but it, it can actually be utilized unless you're willing to acknowledge it. And then you get motivated. And uh, for some of us more sensitive types, I put myself in that category. When I was 19, I recognized that I was already, I was in pain enough to justify doing yoga such that I wanted to get out of that pain. And nothing was really ultimately gonna resolve it that I could buy or you know find a new friend or have a new relationship or changes in my career, those were all just going to be distractions. They weren't actually going to resolve it. So I would say the first thing is to honor or to acknowledge that you're uncomfortable. And that is absolutely, I just, you know, Jason, I don't think that's, I don't think there's a way around that one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen it validated in teachings enough in the scriptures enough to, to, to think that, that that really is the course. It certainly was my experience. And by the way, this woman continued to struggle with, she never turned to practice, the, the story I gave you earlier. So once you, once you feel, once you feel like I'm, it's uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. You now have the, that's the, that's the sand in the oyster. To yeah. me, that ultimately makes a pearl. Um, and, you know, that's what we need to kind of create the friction that's ultimately going to turn us to the self-discipline that we're talking about is really at the core of these practices. And um, once that happens, then here's the good news. We live in an age where there's so many resources. We, you know, even, even you and I having this conversation becomes a resource that will motivate some people to re either remember the value of their practice or turn to practice for the first time. And also, I mean, and then to really what I would offer because don't forget, I was a philosophy major, psychology major, trying to figure it out mentally. I needed a methodology that would actually help me embody what it was I was inspiring to have more of. Mm -hmm. And so then I would say, you know, next step is do something, you know, meditate, yoga nidra, deep rest and relaxation. Um, you know, I, I have, I, I had this realization many years ago um, in, a, in, a, in yoga practice, in a specific very long restorative yoga practice. And I realized like, wait a minute, the more I relax, the more I'm supported. And it meant, it really meant addition by subtraction. And what I was subtracting, if you, if, you know, what I was subtracting in essence w was all my stuff. My worries, my doubts, my fear, my holding on. The more I relax, the more I'm uh, supported. And it's this idea that the more you relax, the more you, you move, the closer you move toward the part of you that's already whole. You know? So in a way, it's turning away from one world and turning toward a different world. And the good news is you don't have to create that other world. For me to be successful in, in this world, I've got to work really hard. You know? It requires a lot of work and discipline. For me to be fulfilled in that other world, I have to do less. Mm -hmm. Well said. I, I think that's such a, a fundamental truth too around, there's no way around getting around it other than acknowledging where you are. I think Pema even said it, start where you are. And it makes me think of when we talk about whether from religion, like know thyself, or even in, in things like AA, or Alcoholics Anonymous, I think one of the first steps is to do a fearless self-inventory. And yeah. the whole purpose of that is to really get an, an honest look at where, we, where you are. 
you know, I think the first step is to admit you had a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think, I think, yeah. So that's very much in line with what we've said. Admit that there's discomfort. And let that be a reminder that there are, that there's a place to turn beyond it. I mean, that's Buddha's thing too. It's like there's suffering. There's a way out of suffering, you know? Um, so um, that's the good news. Um, that's the good news. Yeah. Have we answered the question that began uh, that you started, uh, you know, about the, about in lieu of the pandemic, when people are going through, have we, answered that in real terms uh, or, or practical terms? Yeah, I, it's, I think it's practical terms is gonna be a little bit independent on what people are going to decide to do with it. But I, I think it's, it's almost more of a philosophical more than practical, I think in a lot of ways. It, it's, a, it's a shift in perspective and a mindset that just lets people know that if you are, I think the way you explain it was if you are caught in some of these maybe fear loops or something along those lines that mm -hmm. that in itself is the there's something within that to then sort of stop and reflect inward a little bit i mean most of almost all of this becomes an inward practice yeah yes and it, it and you know I, that's right yeah yeah i mean i don't know that we said it strongly enough or i emphasized it enough i mean i i do I, I do think that even in the most trying circumstances it's vital that we all remember that's a part of us that it's not at the mercy of them and um, this is no different than any other circumstance um you know i spoke to a friend yesterday and i just said look we both concluded the same thing is look you know to the degree that you can be comfortable with the unknown, you'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard it like being okay with the rug being swept out from underneath you a little bit. So <laughs> it's like, we're almost always groundless, but it's being kind of okay with that groundlessness sometimes. And yeah, um, would, yeah. Yeah. I would offer again, just a little bit of my own response to this is that, it's okay to have both. Both they're not mutually exclusive in as much as you can have some sadness and you can have fear, but it doesn't preclude the idea. That it doesn't exclude the idea that you can also be okay. It can be you can be okay in the midst of it, and they can both coexist simultaneously. And we don't have to try and cut out the human part of us that has fear. Um, and if you know that you don't have to solve that part of you, and that there is another part that's not changed by all of this, then, you know, the good news is, um, the good news is you're not having to test this out on a bed of nails. And you're not having to walk on fire. And these yogis would do that stuff to kind of really uh, materialize this idea, this notion that you can, that you're still physical, and yet you can transcend a lot of what the mind assumes it has, how it has to react. Mm -hmm. Well, and a lot of times, like when we really get caught up in fears, it's, it's, it's less about what's happening right at this exact moment. And it's more getting caught up in the story of what we think is going to happen and where it's going to go. And most of the time, that's really what's triggering more of the fear and the yeah. worry. It's this uncertainty, which biologically triggers fight or flight. I mean, we're hardwired for uncertainty because it was a survival mechanism. So yeah. part of it is like, we're all, it's normal. It's normal to get fears. I think then to me, it gets to be kind of like that concept of the first and the second arrow. It's like, it's the first arrow that's going on that everybody's going through. But the second arrow is where are we going with our head? What's the storyline that we're building up to? And because that hasn't actually taken place yet. We don't know. And yeah. that's where I think we get caught more in the, in the loop of it, where we start to get unraveled a little bit. Does everyone know uh, what you're referring to about the arrows? Because it's a great, it's a very powerful and wonderful. Um, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your, you share it. Well, it's, it's, um, it's actually, I'm not sure it's what you were intending, your association reference to it, but the Buddha was asked, how does the Buddha experience pain? versus how does a human being experience pain, a non-Buddha? And he simply answered, his answer was one arrow, 10,000 arrows. And um, 
the explanation then that was given was the first arrow is sensation. The thousands, the arrows that come after that are the stories. In other words, how do we interpret the sensation? So this ties back to the, what now is the understanding of the neurology of emotion, which is it just starts as sensation. So when you say the second arrow, and then there's a third and a fourth, all the way up conceivably up to 10,000 is, the first one is the sensation of what's happening to you. And to the Buddha, an awakened mind, the awakened one then, is the perception of the sensation doesn't change the power of the actual one who's doing this perceiving. The one who's doing the perceiving is unchanged. Now, if I get identified with that sensation and I let the story start to roll, that then creates thousands of arrows, which then create the do come, which is the, the suffering, as it were. So um, it, the fewer arrows, the better. <laughs> and we do what I think, again, the story and your reference to it suggests is that we have a choice. The first arrow I don't have a choice for. You know, no one chose this pandemic, for example. But the amount of arrows is going to be determined by how much I let my mind uh, kind of roll out with its various versions and interpretations and associations to it. A lot of which are, are going to be just simply triggered experiences of our past. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, well said. Thank you. Rod, I want to be respectful of your time, but I would, sure. I would like to ask another question around where desires kind of plays into not necessarily just this but generally the whole big picture and within our dharma and that concept of true calling and moving forward towards that actualized human potential how did the four dyers, desires and if you can break that down a little bit for us and in the role that that plays in wow okay just for a final <laughs> sum up question for you. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, my book is called, uh, you know, the first book I wrote is called The Four Desires. And it's, and it's based on this idea, um, which, which uh, is a little, which was, um, it's based on a fundamental idea within the yoga tradition that is often overlooked or ignored or even contested in, in various spiritual traditions, which is that, uh, according to the yoga tradition, the soul has four inherent desires. Just going through them quickly, one is the desire to become who you were meant to be. It's, it's this, it suggests this deeper teaching that all of us are born from a noble idea, that each of us as an individual is meant to serve this greater whole of which we are a part. And we have a role to play. The way I describe it is we're each a note in the, in the symphony of creation. And our, our job is to play our note or play our instrument as well as we can so that we can, you know, contribute to and we can gain the satisfaction of being part of the symphony. And, you know, if my instrument's not being played or it's not well tuned or it's I've just decided I'm not going to play this week, then something's missing from this larger creation. And your note, if you will, is the very best version of you. It comes out of serving your highest best interest, which by default serves the best interest of everyone. Mm -hmm. That's the number one desire. It's called Dharma. You mentioned that term. The second one is to the desire for the means to fulfill it. So that's physical health, monetary health, if you will. It's also having some shelter, some level of security. We all want that. We don't all have to be millionaires, but the idea here is what do I, I, I have certain physical needs and then I need also, like we're using today and God, most of the world is suddenly using Zoom as a method to interface, to share, to educate, to not feel alone. Uh, another thing I'm hearing about is pet adoption. Now suddenly because of isolation, there are more pets being adopted. So in a way, pets have become also a means to help me fulfill my dharma. They also play into the third desire, which is the desire for intimacy and closeness and sensuality and love and beauty and uh, fellowship and sex, sexuality. All of those come under this heading of um, pleasure. And the fourth desire is the spiritual, well, let's call it freedom. And that really is, becomes the genesis of what we talked about earlier, which is the impulse toward meditation, religion, prayer, contemplation, self-inquiry, which is I'd love to have all those three other desires fulfilled, 
but I don't want to be burdened by the pursuit of them. And so this last piece is to have freedom. Now, many contemplative traditions, religious traditions, would hold the desires the opposite of God, it's kind of going to take you in the opposite way of God and spiritual pursuits. But not so much the yoga tradition is spelled out really clearly in the Bhagavad Gita and other texts, which is that we have a role to play and desire is actually the means to get it. And even Buddha, he spent some time with this because he made a distinction between righteous and non-righteous desires. The righteous desires are what are serving the greater purpose, the greater good. And uh, so um, I would offer that, um, that all four desires are in many ways equally important you know, and that they remain a, a guiding force in our life uh, throughout the duration of our life. And so in now, right now, for instance, is if, if people are feeling particularly challenged at the career level. Now, some people's career is purely uh, dharmic, purely of know feels like their soul's calling and maybe as well it also speaks to how they earn a living for some it's not necessarily yet a soul calling but what i'd say that whatever the changing landscape is in our life at a given time we still need to honor all four desires and uh, that's really as i said kind of the, the the focus of the book the interesting thing, I think the relevant thing and how this ties back into our conversation thus far was the idea that we have in our head maybe a lot of competing ideas of what our purpose might be. And by the way, purpose is not the same as profession. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it really is, is more describes the unique stream, the unique like if I'm at my best, it'll be different than someone else at their best. And I am going to be at my best, both in my family and in my work and in relationship to myself. That's where I find my purpose. And there's a way, ultimately, what I encourage people to do through the process of the four desires is to find language that describes it. Now, this becomes your constant companion, if you will your companion relationships, work, family, your own soul journey, et cetera. And uh, in this sense, hearing, being able to hear what your unique calling is, kind of get past all the voices in your competing voices in your head is really, again, it rests in this idea of stilling the mind. In the end, what I say to people is, we, you know, all of us are answering a singular question. Human beings, doesn't matter where we live in the world or what, how old we are, how young we are, what we do for a living or not. We're all answering a core question. And that is what's next. And by ans asking what's next, it's like, how am I gonna react to this virus? What if my uh, livelihood is severely threatened, what's next? And so how do you answer that question the best way? You, know, you tie it to purpose. You tie it to this innate desire of the soul to be fully itself. And your opportunity to live your purpose is not diminished through a crisis. And, and I would even say it's even more important now than ever mm -hmm. that we find meaning in both the smooth and wonderful times and also in, in times of great uncertainty. It may be, especially in times of uncertainty, and you make, you will find, uh, you will find a level of security and gut and kind of inner guidance that there's no way to otherwise find, especially in a time of uncertainty, like where we find ourselves in this stuff right now. Mm -hmm. And maybe in many ways, that's why I have a certain degree of peace of mind, because I'm just gonna work like heck, commit like as much as ever to live my purpose, you know, irrespective of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Well, and in, in some ways I find, I, I mean, I know 
personally, sometimes when you are in the midst of the busyness of life and everything else, it's, it's easy to it's easy to not look for what your purpose might be or not to really sit and investigate it. And at times like this, I mean, there's a really big pause that's going on for a lot of people. And it is a possibility to, if you, if you don't get succumbed too much by the worries and the fears, but use it to redirect to think, well, okay, well, this is a bit of a space now where I can do some of the different things or focus on some of the things that maybe did get me kind of excited or inspired about. And it, I mean, it, there is an opportunity within it too to um, to redirect your energy into those places because I've said this before, but I feel like most people are waiting for things to get back to normal, but such a good time to reflect on what parts, parts of normal were not so great to begin with. And and there's there's a, I feel like there's that space within this pause to do that. I know for me, given that, I mean, I would normally be in clinic seeing patients. And right now it's like, it's more doing some telemedicine and I've got a lot more time. So it's a lot more time with my family and it's time to really focus on some projects that I've been excited to be able to do that are tied with my, my sense of purpose. You know, part of purpose is, I mean, there's a lot, there, there are several elements and streams that inform purpose. So it's not as simple as, oh, what would I really like to do? Mm -hmm. It's really not that. It's, it, it is as much as anything is what are our some what are our personal challenges because part of our purpose is simply to overcome our challenges identify the traits in you that you have a tendency to fall into that you default into and i would i would actually point you to some significant a significant part of your purpose is to is to over overcome them is to grow beyond them mm -hmm. but i would also offer that because by serving my highest self interest i serve the greater self-interest, if you will. One of the things to think about, I think, is what need am I, am I answering or, or fulfilling? So right now you're fulfilling the need of your patients. And so you're, you're, you're finding a, a methodology to do that. You're finding a, an approach to do that. And honestly, I do think as much as anything, it's about seeing how, the, how needs have shifted and needs are gonna change as a result of this for, for a while, if not forever. Yeah. And it's about, and, and seeing that, you know, looking as best you can and asking about what need, perhaps in the past that I've not answered, or a shift in, in how I've answered the needs in the past or before, and how am I gonna see, how am I gonna to respond to that, you know? Um, and, and how do I step into that need that's still consistent with what feels authentic and meaningful to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting, and I, I am very curious as to what things are going to look like even after, because I do think it's, it's giving a very different look at how things can be and how to fulfill different needs, how to provide mm -hmm. service in different ways that's still meaningful, and it's going to be a lot of things that will change around. That's right. Rod, last, last thing um, before we go here is just given your vast experience in the world of yoga, but not just yoga, also from being a teacher, from being a student, from being a, a husband and a partner and a father and all of the different parts that you've kind of made up Rod Stryker over these last decades, what are some of the most valuable insights that probably mostly impacted your life at different times or, or set you off in certain directions, things that were really meaningful on a personal level for you? Um, you know, it's probably just a hand. I mean, a, a, a really a few important discoveries or, or, or pieces, which is that, you know, I mean, one, one was simply the insight of how, um, how meaningful it was to me to, to always be a student. And I don't mean necessarily, I've always had, I really early on, I told you one of the consequential things was to meet a teacher. But it's also a student of myself and a student of life. It's like just continuing to ask questions. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a saying, a great scripture called Manu, it comes from the uh, 
ancient Vedic, really ancient Vedic tradition. And its idea that it's, it says a person who's ever completely content with themselves is a person who will lose everything. And, I, and it doesn't mean all your riches, but it just like suddenly everything will be gone. But I think that in a sense, the greatest, one of the greatest riches in my life has been keep discovering, keep being hungry to discover more and to ask questions and, uh, and to look for answers both inside and outside. Uh, I would offer that, um, you know, particularly children has, I don't call my children my gurus. I, I, I know people who do that. I've had gurus, so I don't really quite put them at the same, on the same plateau. But, um, you know, ultimately then to one, on, since, I'm, since I'm of the mind that I'm always in, a, I'm still in process, I remain a student of myself and of life. Uh, the idea is really in the end to understand that understand that everyone else is also challenged by life. Um, and as a result, it's really just this idea of compassion, frankly. Um, oddly enough, you know, some people are of the mind that if you meditate, you be, it's an act of self-indulgence. Actually, I find it's the opposite in the sense that you, you quickly figure out that your mind is not well-trained to focus or be in the present. And then eventually the realization comes because you, you start realizing, wow, my mind really goes everywhere else but hangs out in the moment. In the moments where happiness and, and peace lie, but my mind goes everywhere else. Now, if you experience that consistently, sooner or later you're going to recognize the fact that everyone else is having the same experience. No one else is very good at being in the present either. And if you can embrace that idea that, wow, I'm struggling with the pre being in the present. Everyone else is struggling being with the present. And I think it softens us in our relationship to others. You go, man, I'm not the only one who keeps in, who, who's in the maelstrom of this place where peace is less than accessible. <laughs> we are all that way. And so we all deserve, we all deserve compassion. We all deserve it. And I think that's, that's also one of my, uh, I would say, perhaps the great, the great insight. And, uh, you know, uh, this tradition and, and, and my experience has been such, and I, I've already repeated myself a few times in the, in the, uh, during, during our conversation, and that is really the great insight is that the, that the best of me is always there. I don't have to construct it. I just, the more I can slow down and I can remember or I can see it. And from that, there's, an, there's a wellspring, a, you know, a fountainhead of inspiration, strength, and peace. And, and truly, that is, that is the defining inside of my life. And um, I'm so thankful to my teachers and, you know, the tradition itself that, that, uh, that led me there, led me to that realization and insight. And uh, I know that it's made me a, a better, more compassionate person, and also to, to some extent help me uh, help my whatever gifts or talents I was born with help help them come to life. And uh, left to my own devices, if I had been a philosophy or psychology major, or a psychologist or a philosopher, I, I I don't think I would have had the fulfilling life that I've I've had. I, I needed to get out of my head and into this. Uh, connection to uh, to this to this more mm -hmm. essential part of me. Wonderful, Rod. Thanks so much for your time you. and your wisdom and your expertise. And where is the best place for people to learn more about? I know you've got some courses that are online. I know right oh. now there might be some retreats that are put on hold until further notice. But where can people learn more about your work? And you know, they can just go forward. to rodstriker.com. And uh, that'll take you to uh, Par Yoga, and that'll also um, uh, show you all my offerings there. But I would also really advise people, you had mentioned Sanctuary at the be very beginning of our conversation. This is an app. All levels of practitioners come in, and um, uh, uh, there's many practices, relaxation, meditation practices of various lengths, and talks on there, and I do live streams that have been recorded, and people have access to that. And uh, uh, I look in the end again. I said, we have to do something. 
we can want it, but we must take that step to do it. And so that was one of the reasons I created the app, just something super accessible. And we can use that little piece of technology we're carrying around all the time uh, and, uh, and, and use it to be reminded of, of uh, again, the best of ourselves, the, the whole version of ourselves, irrespective of what's happening outside of us. So mm-hmm. sanctuary and rodstriker.com, that'll get them there. Awesome. I'll put those in the show notes as well. So everybody has access to them, but I totally agree with you. I think sanctuary is a wonderful piece of, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's also, it's accessibility. I think that's what people need more than ever right now is the, I mean, now we've got a little more time, but I think a good time to, to start to incorporate the different uh, offerings you've got on that. All right, James. Well, I appreciate, appreciate our time today and our conversation. And Yes, me too, Rod. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, that was awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to invest in your health and well-being. Since this podcast is brand new, reviews and subscribers are so vital for us to get off the ground and share this really important information. So if you found this information valuable, please post a review and subscribe to the podcast so you'll get our newest episodes. Also, if you know of someone who would benefit from this, please share it with them. You can also find us on Instagram at hashtag inspirehealthpodcast. If you have a question that you'd like to be addressed, direct message me on Instagram or leave a comment on one of my posts. I would love to hear from you. And you can grab our show notes and free resources for each episode at inspirehealthpodcast.com. So be sure to go online and check it out.